2019 was the year that we got the biggest movie of the new millennium, yet overall it somehow managed to be very underwhelming. Endgame aside, there wasn't a lot of mainstream movies that left much of an impact. Maybe it's because Disney is slowly cornering the market by producing slightly above average films that are guaranteed to make money, or maybe I'm just being cynical. Either way, there definitely wasn't a shortage of bad films to pick from this year. Please note before watching this video that this is not just my opinion, but an objective fact. These are, objectively, the top 10 worst movies of 2019, and if you disagree with me, then you're wrong. Alita Battle Angel has some of the best action scenes of the year. Unfortunately, the rest of the film doesn't reach the same standard. Most of the acting was bad, it was clearly two separate story arcs stitched together, and they somehow managed to take a female-led story and remove all agency from the protagonist. The only reason Alita does anything is because a man is doing it, and the romance feels super uncomfortable considering that she is characterized as a naive child from beginning to end. People have stated that this is the best live-action anime film to come out, and I agree. However, it's not really that big of a bar to clear. In the world of unnecessary sequels, Zombieland Double Tap was definitely the most pointless one to come out last year. Like most comedy sequels, the narrative is just an excuse to have these characters on screen again. Naturally, that means it's uninteresting and loses the attention that the original had. But what makes this movie truly unenjoyable to watch is that it's not funny. Normally, a movie like this would just rehash old jokes, but this film tends to retell the setups of old jokes and leaves out the punchline. Instead of a joke that's less funny the second time it's told, half the jokes in Double Tap don't even register as jokes. Additionally, the appeal of watching old characters you love gets washed away by having new characters that chew the scenery every second they're on screen. Uh, maybe comedy sequels are just a bad idea in general. Let's hear it for the first Redbox exclusive film to ever be produced. Benjamin is a perfectly great idea that was ruined due to people not having the talent to make a movie. I know that sounds rich coming from a guy who has never made a feature length film, but I can't see any other reason why this film was so bad. The movie is about a group of people having an intervention for the title character only to use the event to air out their own baggage. This is a perfect setup to explore the film's character if it wasn't poorly acted, lazily shot, and written by someone who can't construct a joke. I believe the driving force behind this film is Bob Saget, which makes a lot of sense. I'm curious as to how this would have come out if it was made by some film students, but as it stands, Benjamin isn't half as good as a Hallmark Christmas special. The 2019 Lion King is exactly the same as the original, just slower and not as good. Does that alone make it worthy of being on a worst of the year list? Yes! The thing about the original Lion King is that you can tell by watching it that the narrative was written with the intention of it being an animated film. The dialogue is written so that the characters can show their personalities. The musical segments are built off the idea that these characters can move in ways that real animals can't. And the core romance between Simba and Nala hinges on the fact that you, the audience member, are attracted to Nala. Okay, that last one might just be me, but you get the idea. Using this script, but replacing it with realistic animals and settings makes every aspect of the film off kilter. Also, they did my boy score dirty. Not only did they get rid of his song, they turned him into a straight. That is not cool. This movie is ableist, and not just because the character in a wheelchair is played by an able-bodied actor. A big part of The Upside implies that having a boatload of money isn't enough to make a disabled person not sad about being disabled. Now I get that the film was going for a money can't buy you everything theme, but it completely ignores the fact that the protagonist's life is made considerably easier by being able to afford the most expensive equipment. Essentially, the movie is trying to make you feel bad for this character because he's disabled and no other reason. It's also a white savior movie due to Kevin Hart's character being saved from poverty due to being given a job. And it isn't just that this character is down on his luck. Kevin Hart is shown to be a bad father who is only half-heartedly looking for a job, but he starts to become a better person once he starts to work for the rich white man. Yeah, it's a complete crapshoot. Well, we all knew this one would be here. While not the worst, Cats is definitely the most baffling movie I've seen this year. 
Not only do all the characters look like a human face with photoshopped on a cat body, but the world around them is abnormally large. I assume this was done to make the characters look actually cat sized, but half the time they just look like action figures. The story was pretty bad too. The narrative is that these cats want to win a talent show to make their dreams come true, and one cat keeps Thanos snapping the competition so he can win by default. That's it. Most of the runtime consists of songs introducing specific characters, and the cats being weirdly horny. I'm aware that this is just the plot of the stage play, but based on the few clips I've seen, it's clear that the appeal of Cats the musical comes from watching professionally trained actors prance around in full cat makeup. The lack of a compelling narrative is way less excusable when the cats all look like they were part of a genetic experiment gone horribly, horribly wrong. Enter the Anime is about one woman's journey to understand what anime is, and it is by far the worst documentary I've ever seen. Granted, I've only seen like three documentaries, but this is still the worst. Throughout the movie, the film asks the question, how can anime so crazy come from a place so traditional? This question implies that the movie is about how Japanese culture influences popular shows, but it's really not. The movie doesn't explore anything about the anime industry. It's merely a collection of interviews with the thinnest of narrative threads connecting them together. On top of that, this movie has some of the worst editing of the year. It's like the editor was a 12 year old using Movie Maker in 2004. I seriously got headaches watching this. You may be wondering why this movie isn't lower on my list despite physically injuring me. Well, you see, the filmmaker wasn't a white dude, which makes a documentary about anime automatically 50 times more bearable. I can't think of a mythos easier to deconstruct than Superman. He crash landed in the rural south and was shaped by wholesome American ideals. With our political climate as tense as it's ever been, it should be easy to show how an all-powerful being growing up in Kansas might not end up a good dude. However, Brightburn utterly fails. Instead of being molded by his surroundings, the Clark Kent stand-in is just genetically evil. He's a decent kid growing up, then one day, BAM! Evil. There is nothing that anybody could have done to prevent him from becoming evil. Brightburn asks the question, what if Superman were evil? But that isn't a compelling question to ask. If Superman were evil, he would do evil stuff. That's a no-brainer. What would be interesting is to see how that character could possibly turn out that way. But Brightburn doesn't give us that. Instead, we see a kid kill people because of the way he was born. Every year, there's a movie that everyone loves that I just do not get. After 2019, it was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The film uses the real-life murder of actress Sharon Tate as its climax, but reimagines the event so that the two male leads of this film brutally murder her assailants. This is supposed to be a cathartic fantasy in the vein of Inglourious Bastards or Django Unchained, but the problem is the movie does nothing to build up to it. Firstly, before the hippies go and attempt the murder, they are only ever portrayed as incompetent losers, so having them brutally murdered at the end feels unjustified. Secondly, the themes presented throughout the movie have nothing to do with this climax. A big chunk of this movie is Leonardo DiCaprio's character grappling with the possibility that his time in the limelight is over. He struggles with this until he manages to pull off a performance that shocks his crew members. And then he tortures a hippie with a flamethrower. The story as a whole just feels so disconnected from the climax despite that being the emotional core of the entire film. And finally, there's Sharon Tate. I heard Tarantino rewrote the script because people criticized him for not giving Margot Robbie much to do. But she does so little in this version that I can't imagine what the first script was like. She dances at a party, goes to watch a movie starring herself, and has dinner with friends. That's it. She should be the most important character of this movie, but for some reason she's barely even a side character. The big problem with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is that it's entirely dependent on the audience's emotional connection to Sharon Tate as a real world figure. The movie isn't interested in showing us who Sharon Tate is because it assumes we already admire her. Instead, we get a bunch of sequences of Leonardo DiCaprio acting in area appropriate films and Brad Pitt driving down Hollywood during the golden age of cinema. Because of that, the movie ends up being a boring slog with a climax that feels completely out of place. Gee, where do I even begin with Joker? It sucks. Unlike Brightburn, Joker does manage to comment on something. The oppression of the working class in Gotham, along with the wealthy elite's decision to cut funding from social work, provides the protagonist, Arthur Fleck, the opportunity to become the Joker. If the movie had left it at that, then it'd be fine. However, 
The film brings up so many other ideas in an attempt to comment on society that it ends up ultimately saying nothing. What leads Arthur down this path is that he is no longer able to get access to his meds. This is supposed to show how the rich acting in their own self-interest affects regular people, but it places the blame for Arthur killing on his mental illness. The system fails to provide Arthur with the help he needs, but this doesn't contribute to his motive to kill. He is not a murderer because he's angry at a society that refuses to help him, but because he's mentally ill. Arthur's failure as a comedian, his inability to make social connections, and his lack of morals all come from his mental illness. He was clearly already someone who was on the edge of becoming a serial killer, and no longer having meds was just a tipping point. Now you could say that this was the point, that this movie was meant to show how an unstable person could become a political symbol without meaning to, but the film fails at that too. The injustices of this society are filtered entirely through Arthur, and because of that, we never truly see how the decisions of the rich affect the average person. It makes sense that this one man would be driven to kill, but not why the working class would be so willing to follow him considering how blatantly unstable he's shown to be. Arthur literally goes on TV and tells the city that not only is he not politically motivated to do anything, but that he killed three men because he thought it was funny. Then he shoots Robert De Niro. And for some reason, the working class hold him up as a symbol for the revolution. What would cause them to do this? Are the wealthy exploiting people by making them work grueling hours for peanuts? Are they forcing poor families into ghettos by gentrifying neighborhoods? Did they orchestrate a war on drugs that primarily targets minorities in lower income areas? We don't know. All we're told is that the rich cut funding from social programs and they aren't doing enough to prevent crime. What are they even supposed to do? Hire a vigilante to stalk the low-income areas at night and enact his personal judgment to decide who deserves to go to prison? That would be ridiculous. If there's one thing that kind of sums up my feelings on Joker, it would be what they did with Thomas Wayne. You see, at a certain point, we find out that Arthur is the illegitimate child of Thomas Wayne. And when he confronts Thomas about this, he gaslights him hard. He's telling him, no, your mom was a liar. She was sick. She was mentally ill. She had delusions. She was making the whole thing up. And you would think that this would be the perfect representation of the rich throwing someone under the bus to save their own skin. Like, Arthur and his mom are living in abject poverty, and Thomas Wayne is able to just discard them and live free of the consequences of having an illegitimate child. But, we find out that Thomas Wayne was actually right. Arthur's mom was actually admitted into a mental institution, and she made the whole story up of being in a romantic relationship with Thomas Wayne. So, what's the point of even bringing it up? Just like the entire movie, it's just meaningless. Man, this one took a lot more out of me than I thought it would. As always, you can follow me on my Twitter here, and stay tuned for my next video. It's going to be the top 10 best movies of 2019.